schools. So um, home and community-based services is a national program. Every state has it. What they share with the feds is a state-by-state -state, um, agreement. And Colorado has been very robust. So about eight years ago, Eileen got me interested in this whole process, this HCBS process, started going to all these meetings. And then um, we were working, um, and I joined several groups, we were working on some really mo innovative and some new things to do in this program, including communication and software, and not having to have people have to explain themselves every time they turn around to all the different vendors, have one place where it's all at. And then COVID hit and it all got shelved. Well, it's all back off the shelf. And we're working on some things and I'm working in parts of it again um, to try to make it better for the consumer side and that our providers get treated decently, which is where I end up having a lot of battles with. So today I'm going to work on the second piece of it, which was another year project and on service agreements and rent. And so that you can wrap your arms around the concepts and then we'll talk about some ideas that um, we've been thinking about and um, starting to play with for 2022. All right, so the terminology is called a condition of participation. And in Colorado, the ones that we play with the most is our industry, is the EBD waiver, the mental health waiver, and then we have a few from spinal cord. And then every once in a great while, Hi, Jean. We have a, um, a DD person come in that's aged up and they could be moved to the EBD waiver and sometimes they can keep in the in just the plain DD waiver that they've been on their whole adult life. And so anybody that is approved on the financial side of this process gets the state plan Medicaid. It causes massive confusion in the public and I deal with it pretty much on a daily basis. Um, but these waivers are shared cost waivers. So in the slides that you'll be getting copies of all this, <coughs> we have, um, I've given you a bunch of websites so you can put this in your toolbox. So if you ever have to go look at it, you can figure it out. And this FAQ sheet, I'd highly recommend that you do put, um, pull this and put it where you can find it because it's a quick and dirty reference to some of this HDBS noise. So news alert, 2022, it looks like we are moving and Colorado is joining the movement to what they call value-based incentives. So what we don't know is what it's gonna look like in our market. We've heard a little bit of what it's gonna look like in long-term care, the rehab centers, the subacutes, and the hospitals, but I'm suspecting, since they're forcing all this other stuff down our throat, that they better bless us with this one as well. So that if you have really good surveys, if you're on time with all your data crap that you're required to do, and all that good stuff, that you could get an incentive bonus um, for caring for um, a certain population of Medicaid plans. So we're, I'm waiting to see, I'm following this very closely because I'm gonna really be advocating that it comes down into our industry. Um, one of the things in doing a lot of this work and getting ready for this whole discussion on HCBS, I started looking at some of the other states. So as I said, every state has a contract with the feds on HCBS. And then I went into California because I actually am doing some consulting in California and looked at what they're doing and found this incredible training tool and a flyer. So I'm giving this to share with you because it is spelled it is presented so clearly and so common sensely that it's easier to understand than what Colorado has posted. So you've got, I give so in, when you get these slides, you will get California and Colorado. And the rules are the same, it's just how they educate and express the rules is what's easier from California, in my opinion. So here's some nutshell um, concepts you need to uh, understand. So in every one of your buildings, you live in a municipality and a county. Both the municipality and the county have building codes. And then you live in a fire district. And so you must comply with all of those and be in good standing with that whole entity uh, to satisfy Colorado. 
So like when you do, if you do a major remodeling, you have to submit all your reports to everybody in, to, in today's world. And then they have to approve them. And we have some new overlay called FGI. If you miss any of those steps, you will not get the permission to expand or do any new business in what you think you want to do. And so code enforcement is very, very important. Some of the code enforcement in the municipalities is built more on fair housing and ADA accommodations than anything else. And so you each have a, some sort of fire safety in your building. Some of you are grandfathered in from the old days. Some of you are right up and got the most modern um, program in place like Ray's house is really modernized. And fire safety changed in July. So if, you, if your building sold and went through a change of ownership, they would have to meet the new standards from last July. They would not be able to grandfather in, in fire safety. This is one of the headaches that the people are starting to learn in some of the selling. Um, building codes have really um, become stricter and they're going to be even getting more strict. So some of the challenges in new builds or expansion builds is fire mitigation. So you have to have two hour firewalls. You have to have two hour fire doors. You have to have the spacer between the roof, your natural roof on the outside and your ceiling on the inside that is fire protected and has a retardant in it so that the fire can't go up in the roof or down if you have a sensor in your attic type thing. So I'm seeing stricter and stricter coding both um, here and in California and for the for around fire and then wind and then if you and then emergency evacuation. So one of the things I'm just getting ready and starting to map out is in January um, when I do this session, I'll be on emergency preparedness and building a brand new EMP plan because what we have had in place for several years is not going to work anymore. And so I've been looking at what's not going to work and trying to figure out how we can make it work. So that'll be coming in January. And then for those of you that have memory care, you even have more restrictions and safety codes. So in the past, and I've been in facilities, we had wander guards up because that was okay in a trend for a long time. We had this, we had that. And then um, people got upset about their rights being restricted, no matter how demented they were. And so they got a court order and they got rid of a lot of those things that we put in place. So like um, we even in the community, you know, when I have a really at risk senior in the community that I can't quite place yet, we put a GPS watch on and we can know where they are at any one time. And the GPS watch has a special locking system on their wrist and it's waterproof so they can shower or bathe and they won't kill it. And it gave us all these protections um, with the police and sheriff department. Well, civil rights went to court and made us take them all off. Oh. And so we lost that tool that was really helping us with community management. The, um, some people have gone back to court and they're challenging now. So we'll see what happens in the next layer of law that's coming forward. Um, so just understand that in code management, remodeling, new builds, change of ownerships, you're gonna to have to go through a whole lot more hoops than you had to yesteryear. So rule two, in this piece that we're in is called ADA accommodations. That means, and we won part of this, so they wanted all remodeling or any chow to have 42 inch wide hallways. Well, there's very few houses in the old market that have 42 inch highway, uh, hallways so that they could get a gurney in. And um, so we finally got won that one and they took it out for existing residential houses. Commercial, not, not gonna happen. You have to have appropriate ADA accommodations. So this is a five piece bathroom with the appropriate bars with the appropriate high toilet, with a sink that wheelchairs can go under and with shower space. So part of the problem that I've ran into over the last few years is that um, if you take an older house and try to put a shower in and you don't put a lip, you're gonna have a hallway full of water. And they don't like the lips because that is a barrier or a risk issue for taking a wheelchair over or a shower chair over or whatever. And so we're still not quite got that one ironed out. But um, in the newer builds, the way that they're sub-building bathrooms these days, you don't have to have the lip because the natural flow of the water goes down. So um, ADA uh, compliant bathrooms are a challenge. 
and then all your entranceways. So I hate ramps, especially that take up a whole yard. Um, they look awful in a neighborhood and they really stand out. And to me, that's a more of a violation of rights because you're calling the house out that there is people that are not like the rest of the people in the neighborhood. And that's one of these issues that we've been dealing with in civil rights is making sure that we have inclusion. So hopefully, with fingers crossed, we're going to have some better entrance uh, methodologies in the future. Okay. So chapter seven has some guiding information, but what it really is the guide, if any of you are gonna do something different is the FGI. Do not go pay $500 for an FGI. We got a brand new one coming in March. So we're gonna wait, and then we're gonna see if the rules are gonna leave that thing alone for a while. Where only a few states are adopting the FGI 2021 methodology. And unfortunately, Colorado is one of them that thought it was really cool to be progressive and that we're going to go with these new FGI standards. So Marshall Cook is the gentleman down at CDPHE that I work with when we're playing with this FGI stuff. Very kind guy, very, very kind. And basically what he how he teaches it is if it's in chapter seven, that is, it has more guidance than the FGI that's for the whole country. So the parts in chapter seven that address this rule is section 20, 21, and 22. And the way that I look at it and the way I think about it is whatever we're doing in this, is it safe? And would my relative be alerted at concern? So you're saying, well, why do I need to worry about this in um, room and board and resident agreements? Because this has to be addressed in your resident agreement. So I'll be getting more to that in a few minutes. Okay. In three, you have to have a fair housing accommodation policy. And again, this is in your resident agreement that you will make reasonable accommodations. So one that it just recently um, worked on was to have a lady with end-stage lung disease and she's constantly overheated. And so she likes to fan, I don't care if it's 20 degrees below zero out, she'll have her stupid fan on. And so that was her accommodation that she needed that airflow. And that's when she feels safe and that she can breathe. So that was a reasonable accommodation. And then we had to figure out how to make that work with safety and fall risk assessments and electricity and all that good stuff. So this is an example when I actually used this policy and won a um, situation with the health department. Um, the five is called the warrant of habitability. So the best way to understand that some of you own your property and your assisted living business. And hopefully on the business side, you separated them into two separate businesses because that's the methodology that is preferred in this today's world. Some of you have multiple properties and they all have separate business line items. And so um, when you have this corporate business that owns the properties, they have to have this warrant to have ability and it has to be done yearly. And in these two-day reviews that they're doing um, out there, whether you're a Medicaid or not, um, if you have a mother company with in one entity and you rent to the mother company your business, then you will have to show that you have this completed. So I um, attached the forms and I also put in the toolkit um, a PDF copy so that you could just print them. Rule six, again, same thing. It is a rental property condition list. So it doesn't matter whether you do um, Medicaid or not. If you have the mothership and you have a separate business, then you have to have a rental property. If you're renting your property from um, a group, then you have to have this form um, also. So this is pretty good to do because it gives you a pretty good idea of safety issues and then what condition. Um, three of the things that I have found the most issues have been is if you're using, if you have a ramp and it's wooden and you know how Colorado weather dries everything out and then the wood gets all splintery, you're going to have to, you have to sand it and put a clear cover on it and keep it protected so nobody gets splinters in their hands. It's one of the common things I see. If you have metal rails that you're gonna to have to either put a cover on so that people don't get burnt in the summer if you've got the old fashioned metal rails um, or you put in the new ones that are heat um, protected. 
And so you're seeing it all over the uh, nation. They're changing those rails out because of burns that have happened to people when touching them. So there's a couple examples that are in these rentals. Um, they look at flooring, they look at tile, they look at backsplashes, they look at countertops, they look at um, and, um, heater grates. One of the ones that I saw a lot of tags on was um, floor vents. So wheelchairs will um, beat those things up in a hot minute. And so you may have to end up changing those on a yearly basis. And if they're not clean. So I have quite a few buildings that I've been in that use um, radiant heat or use floor heat with the little coils. And those coils get really grimy and icky and they don't get cleaned enough. Or the, the staff, you know, somebody knocks off the cover on it and the staff throws it away, stuff like that. Those are the types of things you'll see in this and why you need to, um, you know, keep a good eye. And this is a great tool just to know that you're meeting um, base standards. All right, so now I'll bring it back around why all this stuff pertains to what we're doing. So two years ago, three years ago, um, the feds were reviewing leases in um, adult care facilities, adult, uh, adult living communities, residential buildings with HUD, all that. And they went, you know, uh, these 35, 50 page legal documents you have, put them in the trash. These are inappropriate and they are not have, you're not communicating with the people you're serving. And so they were on a really good trajectory of nationwide and making um, entities change their agreements. And it, it hit it in our industry. And so then started working with some other things, including eviction issues, and found out that we really needed to have a two-part um, rent and lease assessment agreement. And there's several reasons for that. And we'll be talking about this as we go. So in your room and board language, for those of you that do straight HCBS and you don't take InnovAge, um, but even though on InnovAge you have the same issue. So you have a paperwork that says the, the consumer or the resident gives you X amount of dollars per month by a certain date. And that is called a petty in the language world of HCBS, or you can call it room and board, okay? And that is a freestanding. So two years ago, because there was so much fraud in the rental market in our state, we had um, a lot of buildings that were owned and the owners would only take cash and they wouldn't give leases out. And then they would say that people hadn't paid and they were evicting people and the courts identified this. And then communities identified it and then states started looking at it. And so it's back on the table, they're going around. We have a new law that says you have to have a separate a rent agreement that's in simple language and easy to understand and be able to um, actually execute it. The reason that this is great in our industry and the tool is already made by the state, so you don't have to think because it's already sanctioned and it's already passed um, up through the courts and came back down is okay, is that if somebody don't pay their rent agreement in chapter seven, you can discharge and give a 10 day eviction notice for lack of rent because the 30 day eviction notice is gone now with COVID. So we're back to the 10 day one. And then you can at 10 days, if they still haven't paid up, you can file it in eviction court and you can evict somebody from your community only on rent by itself. So this is in our favor. It's not, a, uh, even though we have to do these two pieces of paper in our work, it really is the tool more for you than it is for the consumer. So sometimes, and I see this happen all over the state, um, people move into facilities and they had a rep payee. They never even knew um, what was happening with their money. And then they would get a little bit of money. And then in the old days, and especially in my adult care communities, we would divvy that up over four weeks and they would get an allowance at once a week and, and split that money up. And they would do better, especially if they were sm cigarette smokers. Um, then HCBS got in the middle of the way and said that, you know, uh, these folks shouldn't have to have a rep payee just because they're in the buildings and on their SSI, especially. And so we went through this great big, huge tip for tap type thing. And so when a resident handles their own money, if they don't pay you on the day they're supposed to, or they spend their money doing something else, which we've had, I'm thinking of a case that um, Jeff actually had two years ago where the guy disappeared in a car that he had gotten his hands on and went on a joy trip and then didn't want to pay his rent. 
Um, and so it, we could use that back then and we could have booted him immediately and with that 10 day notice. So um, that is a tool for you. The second part of the tool is called a service agreement. We have finally as a country got down to three levels of services. So we have what we call core services, which I'll review in a second. Then we have services above and beyond core, where that's more personal care, additional needs, or redirection, behavioral management, that type of thing. And then we have level three. I consider level three mostly memory care and end of life issues. And so the majority of the work that you guys do is level one and then your additional level twos. And that needs to be spelled out. And then every once in a while, and it could be quarterly and it could be more, but it can't be less than yearly, you have to do a new service agreement. And then if people get a raise or you get a new petty paper saying that you know their, um, their portion has gone up a certain amount of dollars, you need to do a new rent agreement. The other thing on rent agreements, they are month to month and service agreements can be made the same way. You are not obligated to give a one-year lease. And I'd recommend highly you consider not doing that. All right, so here's a checklist of things you need to think about, okay? All residents, I don't care how they pay, should have the same service agreement options. That's a civil right, is that everybody's treated equitably, okay? It has to be clear, short, and written in plain language. So the federal rule is you can't have more than seven letters in a word or more than seven words in a sentence or more than seven thoughts in a paragraph. So it's called the rule of three sevens. And I knew nothing about it till a few years ago. And so this is one of, another reason that lawyer language is getting um, thrown out heavily is that they violate all of that and they make it so convoluted that you don't really know what you're signing. All residents have to have the same protections from evictions. So in your agreements, you have to have an addendum, and this is where I'm putting it in my thinking, on um, what, what would be a reason for eviction and what would it look like. So you have to have a policy and you have to have an addendum in your initial, um, in your initial paperwork with a new client, okay? The space in the room may be, have to be identified. Well, we went through this crazy period of time where you couldn't identify rooms with numbers because again, that was um, a violation of privacy. And then we couldn't put names on doors. So that was another violation. And, but we did get away with putting pictures. If, he, if a resident wanted a picture at their door, we got away with that finally. And we could put first name. So we're not violating privacy, the PI rule. And so I don't care if you say um, hallway, you know, blue hallway door, uh, left door or second left door. Um, you just got to do something to identify your rooms. Now, the fire department, on the other hand, really needs more help than that. So when you have your fire um, plan and you have your rooms identified, um, there's two things they need to help them be safe is they need to know how many residents is in the room. And then if any residents is got an ADA accommodation like wheelchair walker and coding on that. So you're gonna see in some rules um, coming up this next summer, um, some code marks that'll come into your fire when you submit your annual fire inspection and get that new approval and how are you gonna identify this? So this is some more work that will be done. All right, then in six, the term and duration of the agreement. So like I said, everything I've looked at, everything I've been thinking about for a long time, I think you're safer on a month to month than you are anything else because you never know when somebody's going to get sick. You never know when somebody's going to have a, you know, a, a major issue happen and you can't meet their needs in chapter seven for immediate discharge, you can't meet their needs. And so if you got a one year lease, then, then you're gonna to have to come up with another form releasing them from their lease. So it's up to you. You can do an annual lease with a release or you can do a month to month. Number eight is the refund policy. This one has had me somewhat baffled. Um, so in private pay, we can do a community um, assessment fee. And because there's so much paperwork to gather before somebody moves in and get all this stuff organized. So you can get away with that pretty easily in the private pay side. And in the Medicaid side, it's really hard to get away with, but you can have a security deposit. 
so for property that goes under your rental agreement so if you look at rent agreements in apartments houses commercial buildings whatever uh, they do have a clause in there for damage deposit and that's where on the medicaid side we can ask for a damage deposit it's in the rules and then you got to be careful that you have the right signatures so if you have somebody that's got a guardian from the court and a conservator you're going to need the guardian to sign the service agreement and you need the conservator to sign the financial agreement the conservator is not responsible other than to make sure the bills pay and as long as they haven't done something stupid like you know leave the country or go to mexico got one of those going on right now um you know, or just abandoning the patient, period, and won't do anything, um, then, you know, they are accountable to the court and they can be held in contempt of court. And so this one case I'm looking at, that's probably how we're going to have to go is to contempt of court issue. So the resident can sign it and then legal authorities can sign it. Now, if you um, have DPOAs, remember that's medical, so that's service agreement. And if you have a POA, that's financial, and that is only that they're signing the signature. They're not responsible um, for the action of the resident. And so this is where it gets sticky. So when you have a resident that is not capable it, to um, actually do what they need to do, like pay their bills, then we probably need to go to court and get a con um, conservatorship appointment. It's very easy. I help families do it quite often. It's not hard. It's just a matter of some paperwork and why we need to do it. All right. So I want you to think about um, involuntary discharges when you get stuck in this situation, okay? It's not only about you. You're going to have to include some other people. And so one, the ombudsman has to be notified. I don't care how, what kind of payment you have in your house. The ombudsman is part of this. If they are with a single entry point like Rocky Mountain Human Services or Jefferson Options or Loveland, um, Larimer County Options, um, you know, then you notify that case manager that is responsible for that contract. And then in the future, anybody that's on any of our HCBS products, HIPPUP, HIPPUP is going to require a hearing unless it's an immediate discharge for a health reason. So if it's a behavior discharge, we've got a whole new hassle in our way um, coming very, very shortly. And so um, example, um, got a gentleman and he has really short-term memory issues and he, we were giving him like two cigarettes an hour and, and lighting his cigarettes for him. And it was part of what his care plan. And then the um, people in charge said, no, you, he, that's violating his rights. And so you got to give him his cigarettes. And so dang, if it didn't take him but two days and he was smoking in the house. And so then we went back to that again. And so we put him on what we call a rights restriction, um, which I'll be talking about next session more in depth. And then we had to go through all these II changes. And the reality is we had to find him a new home to live in because he wasn't safe and he needed a lot more supervision than this facility could muster. Um, so these are the kinds of things we've got in front of us coming. And well, all I can tell you is you really need to think carefully before you accept new admissions and make sure that you have mitigated the risk as much as you can um, before you let them in your house. Because once they're there, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, had another um, young man and he's lived three times in a facility and he gets he gets um, his buttons pushed. Um, for a variety of reasons. And the only way he knows how to handle anger is to put a hole in the wall. And so um, he was allowed, the first time he put a hole in the wall, um, then, you know, he had to pay for it and he didn't have any extra money because it took two months of his money to repair the wall, the mess he made. And so he wasn't happy about that. And then dang if um, he didn't put another hole in the wall. So he was um, hauled off um, literally over to the crisis center and then we wouldn't accept him back well now we don't have that right so he just recently contacted the facility one to come back and I said don't do it because we already know he's going to put another hole in the wall and I just don't want you don't want to go through that you want to have to go through a hearing in HICPAF with somebody that's got repeat behavior and the behavioral health people can't um, seem to mitigate it or make a dent in this whole thing um, medical 
remember in Medicaid that um, there's a rule for HCBS that if they're in the hospital more than 30 days, you have to discharge. So don't forget that tool, okay? And it's a that's a blessing in your in your life. And then if the elopement is another one of those things that I run into. So um, somebody's um, mental health status changes or, you know, their um, impulse control goes away or they're drinking again after being dry for 10 years um, and they elope to go and get inebriated and then the police bring them back. Um, so, you know, this is our newer one that I'm dealing with currently um, with a facility. And so we're working on um, permanent discharge um, because unless he gets back on medications to, car to decrease that craving for alcohol, this is not going to change. And then when he's drinking, he's awful to be around. Um, so these are just some of the things that I have dealt with uh, personally in the last year, year and a half. All right, so in chapter seven, let's look at some things in section 11, okay? When can you discharge? All right, an acute physical illness. So examples of that would be a stroke, heart attack, broken hip, um, head, a head injury from a fall. Those would be an acute physical illness. A physical limitation. So remember in our industry, we can support somebody to stand, we cannot pick them up. And so that's skilled care from a CNA. And it's because we don't train our staff to for body mechanics. And therefore, your workman's comp don't cover you if you are doing body mechanics outside the scope of our work. So 10 years ago, we were ambulatory, no devices, no walkers. You could have a cane, but no walkers and definitely no wheelchairs and no electric wheelchairs. Well, that's changed over the last 10 years. And I'm not sure where we're going to go with this issue. But if they have to have you before you let them in your home, you need to see them do all these things because they got to be independent and their fall risk assessments got to be really low or you're kicking your own self because if they get falled and get injury, your liability insurance said you allowed somebody in your facility outside the scope of practice and therefore we're not covering this liability. So, li so because of several things, liability insurance has really taken an attitude in the last six months. Um, incontinence issues. Again, we had zero incontinence in our industry 10 years ago. Didn't take anybody, no pull-ups, no catheters, no nothing. They all went into long-term care. Long-term care got overloaded, so they uh, convinced the state to let you know people that were with it and could participate to come back into our industry. And we have way too many people in our industry that are beyond what we should be taking care of with incontinence issues. So if people are not using the tools to deal with incontinence, medication or surgical interventions, or um, these new sensors or uh, prostate management type thing, they may be outside our scope of care. So incontinence is back on the table. Um, any yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can we go back to the incontinence? Because it, it's a kind of a tricky area. It says that cannot be managed by resident or staff. What rule. exactly does that mean, cannot be managed? All right. So the exactly is you should only have to give a reminder and minimal assistance. So let's say over at your house, Maggie, here in downtown, you have a guy that has incontinence issues. The staff should only have to say, Charles, you need to go and get cleaned up, change your pants, and um, put on a new pull-up. That's as far as you should have to do. And if they can't do that, then they may not be able to stay at your facility. Thank you. Okay. And so remember, in, remember, we are participatory communities, not anticipatory community. So when you run a memory care, incontinence is pretty normal in memory care. And we and that's covered in 25. So we have a little bit more leeway in a memory care to do more hands-on support for incontinence than we do in ACF, typical ACF or ALR uh, world. Um, if we get people with pressure ulcers, so this is a big hassle we have um, also because there, you know, there is equipment or material that you can put on a pressure ulcer and you really don't need to change it more than twice a week and a home health nurse can do that, but the department has decided that that's not safe anymore. And so if they, have, if they are staged by a wound care nurse or a doctor that it's three or four, they have to be discharged to rehab until it's healed and they can get back to a stage one. 
So this is in 12.4, and it's very uh, specific to that. I have not heard as much about pressure ulcers in the recent months as I heard last year. All right, so E is another one that's pretty interesting. So an immediate discharge, and I want you guys to know this all goes in that um, discharge policy that you're going to give as an addendum to your um, resident agreement, okay? And I would just copy and paste this. I would keep it just to this language so you're not you don't need to explain it. Um, it's just the policy. All right, so profound disorientation. So I'm gonna go back to my guy that started drinking again. So when he starts drinking, and it don't take very much, he becomes profoundly disoriented and he, and he has a safety concern. So we're using this language that the department kindly gave us to um, secure the discharge to long-term care where he can be under more supervision. Will they be able to do a better job? I doubt it, but he's at risk for the other residents in the house because of his behaviors. And then G is the more services provided. So again, let me go back up. Okay, so these are the common things we do. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some more specific core things in a hot second here. Then we, we have to do a better job of getting our heads around what kind of residents we can actually take care of in our facilities and what skill sets we have, especially since COVID's kicking up again heavily. Okay. And then can we actually meet the needs of the residents? So what I see in POCs is say uh, resident needs not met. And, um, and then a POC is written on three places actually. And so they're using this against the industry. Okay. All right. Something else that's new is let's say you move in somebody into your facility, they meet a different person in the facility and those two decide they wanna be roommates. Can they do that? Yes, they can. Do you have to give them, do they have to wait 30 days? No, they just need to sign a voluntary room change. Cause again, we're not gonna violate their rights and say you have to wait 30 days. Now, if they wanna change rooms every day, well, that's gonna be a problem. But if you have to move a resident, let's say a room has bed bugs or a room had some other thing and it's gonna to have to have some repair work before any gets called habitability, doesn't meet those criteria. Or you, or you need to get two clients together because you've got an opportunity for a private room and you want people to move in together. Remember, you have to give a 30 day notice. So you might get into a little bit of a sticky place on this. And what I would do is work with the ombudsman and see if you can figure out a workaround on this issue. Don't forget to change your census forms and your emergency medical service um, room information and your fire room information um, for the fire department when you do room changes. All right. So um, in the work, when these folks, especially from the HCBS community come into your home, the single entry point is doing a whole new coordination. They've got a whole new pile of work in front of them. And one of them is a right to ask for help from them and to contest a discharge. So they have case managers, whether it's Innovage or a county or any other um, entity that uses a single entry point case manager for assistance. Most of the residents don't remember this. And so part of our responsibility is to, when you're sitting and talking with a resident that it's not going to work and it's time to figure out a new place to live, is to remind them that they can contact their case manager at the single entry point. I would tell you in my work, 95% don't have a clue um, who their case managers are. I'm always emailing over there. There's one young lady I know over and she'll track it down for me and help me figure it out. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some other issues we get to deal with, okay? Physical abuse of a staff or another resident, that's intimate physical harm. So you send somebody to the hospital and the hospital tries to send them back and they've done intimate physical harm, you still have the right to refuse them to return. Now, does that mean that they won't just charge them to a shelter or the street? No, because it's happening. Um, but you have the right to protect your other residents. You do have to act quickly and make sure you're notifying a pile of people. And um, you may end up um, I've seen this happen where you will have to pay for a hotel room for them for five days while they find a new place to live. 
Um, and again, that's cheaper than having a liability lawsuit against you. Um, so when you have an HCBS client and you give them an eviction notice where it's not an immediate, but it's a 30 day behavioral eviction notice, um, we're gonna have to now start having hearings with HICPA. Since this is just starting, I have no clue how this is gonna go. And I did meet the three girls that are gonna run these hearings and they will be on a Zoom type meeting. Um, but we'll just have to see after we experience it. Cause like I said, I have not had an, um, an opportunity where we had to do this though. I've got several cases pending that I think I'll get some fairly quick training in this in, a, in the next few weeks. Um, just in case you, um, in case you are wondering about this federal noise, what I understand from California, if we are evicting somebody and it's violating a civil right, the single entry point and the client can ask for a federal court hearing with civil rights. I have, don't have any clue what this is going to look like either here or over there, but um, it's actually new in the federal rules. Okay. So evictions. So remember on the room and board side, you can collect a security clock. Um, if it's not anything more than normal wear and tear, you do have to give a security deposit refund and it needs to be spelled out. I would encourage you guys to look at some security deposit language in the laws, see what matches your community the best and figure out how you want to handle that. If there's damage to the room, like my gent that puts the holes in the walls or in some buildings where the wheelchairs are beating the hell out of the door jams or running into the furnace vents or tore down the closet, um, you know, it tore the closet up, whatever, then um, you can charge for those secure those repairs and then give the balance um, in the security deposit back that you need to really think about how you want that to look. All right, so some special considerations. So remember, we're not talking about room and board, now we're on the service side, okay? So you have to be willing, if you're willing to take a client back after a hospitalization, but you need a modification of rights. We will be talking about this next month more in depth, but you're gonna to wanna to do this before they get back in your house. And the hospitals are not going to understand this, nor have the patience for it, because it's not gonna happen in a day. And so you're going to have to defer this to the single entry point, and it's really going to be their responsibility. So here's one, one of my concerns about this whole thing. They're going to try to send them home on a Sunday to try to get out of it. The hospital is going to try to take every little option they can to send people home. Okay. If they cannot um, sign their paperwork, they have become so impaired they can't sign anymore, um, then the families, um, or you guys can call me. I've done enough probate work now. At least I know how to get this started. And so far I've been very lucky. All of mine have been accepted. I haven't had any jam ups. All right, so rule nine, you have landlord and tenant rights as an addendum. These are driven by statute. And so you don't need to think about it. All you got to do is go over to the landlord and tenant rights, copy and paste them onto an addendum, have a signature and a date. You do have to review them on a yearly basis. So one of the things that, like I said, I'm really a fan. So you have the room and board, you're going to have the service agreement, and then you're going to have several addendums because the addendums are things that will change more often than the other two parts. All right, how many of you have person-centered policies? Or maybe I'll ask the other way. Does anybody not have a person-centered policy? Okay. So person-centeredness is the buzzword all over the place. Um, actually, Eileen and I were talking about it this morning a little bit um, because the federal um, directives for um, forced mandated vaccines and the state directives are polar opposite. So we were thinking about how we could use person-centeredness to try to see how we're going to have a fair um, shot at this because we can't afford to lose much more of our industry. We need everybody that's working to stay working and we need to hire. So um, it's one of those issues and this is a chance that we can take person-centeredness back and turn it back on the federal government and the state government. Is this person-centered? Are we doing the right thing for the right reasons? Um, or are we doing it for, to play politics? Okay. 
All right, so you, I'm sorry to bother you again. Do you know of a good uh, person-centered uh, training for staff? Uh, Hickbuff so, used to have one, but it's so dated. Um, it's totally archaic. Um, so there's two, two ways that I'm doing it right, that right now, Maggie. For those of the people that have Relias as a contract, they have a, they have a national person-centered conversation, and actually it's really good. And then I'm doing one that's more geared towards our state and what person-centeredness means very much like what we're doing today. It's kind of geared in the same methodology. I make it um, house to house. The reason I do that is because what I wanted the houses to do is talk about what they're experiencing within their own community. So I did it at Greg, with Greg's, at Greg's place a couple of years ago, and we talked about his community. And I like to keep it that way. I, I thought about doing something bigger, but then they would, it would lose the whole person-centered concept because every community has its own ambiance, its own personality. So I haven't changed my mind on that. Um, but that's where my head's at at the moment. So yes, I do have that available. Um, all right, so on your lease, okay. Rent is that room and board part, all right? Damage deposit, in my opinion, goes on the room and board side, okay? And your rent in statute, it tells you what it covers. So it co if, if like, let's say for instance, uh, our office building here, you know, Eileen had to sign a major rent agreement you know, the electricity is on us, the wa you know, water is shared, sewer is shared, um, you know, whatever. And it was a pretty major long contract. She went through days of negotiations on it. Um, when you have a house, when you rent a house, it might have different parts on it and maybe very separate. Your rent, your room and board agreement, your rent agreement and cover date um, is inclusive. So in other words, you have a fee for the month because the state says this is what you can bill and it covers water, it covers electricity, it covers sewer. So here's another challenge. You take somebody on six liters of oxygen for some crazy reason and you're looking at a hundred dollar a day electric bill. Okay and two liters of oxygen can cost you 200 a month of your money that you're already um, and you're not getting additional funds for that because the state doesn't recognize that. So I, that's why I said, you gotta be kind of smarter than the state um, of what it costs to actually have somebody there on the room and board side, okay? All right, I've talked about um, that you can evict for lack of payment, okay? And the two, the terms are in this deep black. So non-payment or failure to comply with a valid signed resident agreement. Language, we're gonna put right back at them. They, are, they supplied nice language for us, okay? And then, you, so the single entry point side and HICPUF and a bunch of other people, they say, well, you had to attempt to rectify and include everybody and try to get this solved. So, you know, we go through this periodically and then we say, you know, we give them the final eviction notice and all of a sudden the money shows up. And that happens fairly often. Um, and I hate that. It, you know, it just means that you can't trust the family to do the right thing for the right reasons. And or they're using their the funds, which I have seen both. Okay. Um, general reminder: Do not become a rep payee. Used to be very popular in our industry. Don't do it. Um, you're just hanging yourself out to dry. All right. So service agreement. I went looking around. Spent quite a bit of time looking at literacy protocol. What literacy protocol means? Are we meeting this new regulatory that simple language, simple concepts, and you can and people can understand it? I found this really cool thing called Newton Free Library. So again, um, this is a great tutorial. Please look at it. it may help you with how, um, some language-based information that you might want to look at. Okay, and then look at core services on Chapter Seven. Okay, so let me quickly do one quick thing, and. Give me a second and I'll have it right up. All right, and can everybody still see this okay? Okay. So here is the things why you can't move somebody in. You're covered on any of these areas, okay? We talked about that. Here's your, your written disclosure of information and here's your agreement things. 
So general services, specific services, fees to hold a bed, which you cannot do in Medicaid, but you can do on the private side. And then who's responsible for these items, linens, bath supplies, furnishings, auxiliary aids, that type of stuff. And then the, this is more noise about the management funds. Sorry, I don't mean to make you dizzy. And then more noise about the discharge and immediate discharge. My recommendation, you copy and paste these, make these policies and update your policy book to um, cover that. All right, so core services, here's the minimum. Room and board, which we've been talking about. A safe environment that me, and that's why I went over that code and fire stuff with you and kind of brought your head back around it is to help you or remind you what this particular sentence means. Um, so 12.1a is that very first few slides I went over. Then personal services and then protective oversight. So I see 12.1d um, cited fairly often, um, not appropriate measures for an anticipate, unanticipated situation. Um, and I keep seeing that come up. So Pat, uh, back to protective services, that's always a gray area too, because in, especially in HCBS, they want them to be able to go out in the community whenever they want to, yet you are supposed to know where they're going and, you know, if they're putting themselves in danger, how do I know? Um, you don't. And that's yeah. the example of running an ACF is that um, you're trying to you're trying to balance that, and this is why we have to tighten up with the single entry point. Um, looking for something that I wanted to. If you need new resident rights, I made it really pretty, but these resident rights, I put them on really pretty blue paper and we're just using them right out of the policy and we're not worrying about anything else. I'm looking for stupid core services that I want, so. if I could find. So there's a nice list of core services and I just got to find it. Okay, here it is. So this is your responsibility as administrators. So yet you understand admissions, discharge, behavior expression, which is really fun with alcoholics. Care needs assessments, really big um, push to do a better job with pre-assessing. Fall management assessments, food, person-centered care, personal services. So again, remember we are um, participatory, not anticipatory. That we, um, we, we've got to figure better ways of dealing with sexuality and aging issues. Um, that is a um, major state initiative right now is aging issues and that we um, support med uh, medication management. All right. So those are things you naturally do. And, um, and, you, and you probably don't think twice about them for the most part. All right, let me come back to what I was doing. All right, so um, you need to modernize. I'm glad you're here today. And like I said, we're gonna send you a toolkit of stuff to help you and then the doors open because you're here today to talk to me. And if you um, are stuck in an area, you're probably not the only one because a lot of this we're reworking. And then um, remember that you're responsible for quarterly review and you're supposed to sit with your resident quarterly and have them initial that um, you've had a, co a conference and that everything's in place or you made these adjustments or you did a new addendum for um, the things that you need to do. All right, and then like I said, I gave you um, some, a lot of stuff that's online. I gave you the actual form for rent agreements and um, a couple of other things that I thought would be helpful. And like I said, the, the world is open. I'm more than glad to help at any time um, you need it. <laughs>